All right, we're all very excited about this, as indeed GAA fans all around the world are going to be. We're talking with Paul Rouse about his new book. It's called The Hurlers. Paul, this had the bang of um, an eight-part epic HBO series to me when I was flicking through it here. It's like there's jump cuts, there's um, amazing kind of uh, different venues, there are titanic characters struggling and bouncing up against each other and sometimes in agreement, sometimes in collusion, sometimes up against each other. It's, it's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I'm open to the series, obviously. Jarrah, <laughs> uh, it was an amazing pleasure to research and write it. It was it's it's an extraordinary story. I just had to stay out of the way of it. It was um, people doing something extraordinary at an extraordinary time, and the fruit of their labours is the game we see around us today, the game of hurling we see around us today. But it, the it's made by the people as all good history is and as all good modern stories are, yeah. they're made by people. And the people involved in this are, they, they, they are brilliant in what they do. They're bizarre, they're absurd. Uh, and they, sometimes they get on and sometimes the people who get on then don't get on anymore and the fallout is spectacular. They're also entirely inconsistent along the way. Like they become mad for something and then it's like, actually, you know, I've changed my mind, which is human. I think if there is one characteristic of, of the people there, it's, it's the sheer humanity, the, the scale of the mistakes, the scale of the achievement. It is, um, they, are, they are people who are, and they're all very young. That's the thing about it. These, these guys who are making the modern game of hurling were all largely in their 20s. Yeah. With the exception of Michael Cusick, who was into his 30s, and Morris Dabin were into his 30s. The rest of them, were, they were in their 20s. These were, these were young men, and some of them in, right at the start of their 20s. There was a few things that, like the, the, to get the nerdy bits out of the way. How do you know what songs are sung after dinner in the uh, the central executive? Central executive had this meeting which goes on for a second day, and then they have this mad slap up dinner where they're celebrating all their achievements. And we can talk about some of their achievements in a while. But how do you know where the songs, what the songs, what the list of songs were sung that night? How, where does that, those details come from? Because just as now the internet and everything around Google, everything that is there now, the, what, what, what we see around us, the information that's made available on Twitter every day or on, on around Facebook every day, that was the newspapers in the 1880s. So the local press, the national press and the international press. And what I did, I suppose this is the nerd element, as you say, what I did for the guts of 20 years was across a series of years from 1882 to 1889, I went through just day after day, year, year after year of newspapers, both local and national and international, to find, to find this stuff. The, um, the, the other detail that I didn't know was that they were playing with a red ball in the All-Ireland Hurling Final. Like, I don't even know how they made red letter balls in those days, but like, it's those little bits of detail that suddenly take you from reading a book that's a history book into a story that is suddenly alive before you. Well, I, I think, I think the, the virtue of every story sits in the detail. If you can pull the detail out that people can connect with, then you've got a chance of making a, a, a story that feels real yeah. and something that people can identify with. Like the fact is, they stitched the red leather ball in a pub using using thread and needles and and put had cork in the middle and cord around the cork, and they made it for the game because, of course, the modern sporting world that we know around us with its manufactured balls and its 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 commercialized sporting material was only in the making then. And you had, say, for example, Gilbert rugby balls, which we, which everybody who knows rugby knows plays Gilbert balls. Yeah. Gilbert was originally a shoemaker in rugby town beside rugby school, and he started to make footballs for the boys from spare leather around the shop. And that's why he, he couldn't make a round one, so he made it a kind of a dodgy shape, which explains the, the shape of the rugby ball. I didn't know that. So, so it's all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, is, we, we, this is kind of like the, the really pre-modern part of sport, just and what you see here in the in the 1880s is the tipping point into modernity when it comes to sport. And is that what you're drawn to it? Because it's like everything. It's a wild west in in so many like in political terms, in sports political terms, in how the games are played. Like there's lots of violence in on the field. There's a great bit in the book about the um, the Cork uh, footballers trying to set up their own league, the Cork National Football League. Which yeah, I mean. I'm not entirely surprised that the people of Cork decided that their rules were better than everybody else's, but they had a, a set of rules that didn't work because the existing rules were really for the country lads. As they saw them and they, they thought, you know, we are, we are Cork City boys, we are, we are much well, we're well healed. We can't be going to work with black eyes and cut faces <laughs> and all manner of injury. So we're not playing by the country rules, we're setting up our own 
league as we say we're leaving the GAA and we're going yeah. to set up the Munster National Football League and, Sean, Sean and Cavanaugh would agree with them I suspect well, after last weekend, uh, you would imagine so. But um, it's it's one of those things. So so it's and it's this thing. Everything here is in flux. Everything was in the making. Like that, this this world that we now take for granted in terms of the organisation of sport didn't exist until these men started. And it was all men at this stage, and it, it was perceived as being for men yeah. by men. Now women came to matches, but were not perceived as being people who would ever take the field. So this world was being made by men. Uh, at, at this very juncture, I, I, I kind of talked over my own question there. Why are you drawn to this particular time? It was a complete accident at the start. I, I, I was working as a, a local journalist down in Offaly, my hometown in Tullamore, and I was going through the newspapers and I saw a report, a republication of an old report, of a match report, um, and it said that the first All Ireland hurling final was played in Burr, mm. uh, just 20 miles south of uh, Tullamore. And I didn't know this. I should have known it probably, but I didn't know it. And I just thought, oh, I'll look up that. And I just began from this that This is when moment. you're in your 20s. This, I was in my... This is, this is the middle of the 90s. Right. Um, yeah, when I'm in my 20s. And I just slowly... But I just got pulled into it. And it was only... It was afterwards that I realised uh, that actually there's a real story here. Yeah. You know, this, is, this is much bigger than just the story of a match. This is the story of, of how the modern sporting game of hurling was pulled out of the past, how this ancient game, which we know has been played for millennia, was kind of squeezed into a modern playing field. Well, I'll get to that in a minute, because there's one last, um, there's, there's two brilliant set pieces that I want to ask you about um, that kind of bookend the book. Like, one of my earliest sporting memories is the a Thai under-14 hurlers won the county championship and they end up going to fail it, and there's a march, and there's a picture, like I was, my dad was the manager, and I'm about six or seven when it happened, and there's a picture of us marching. We just joined in for the crack. We weren't supposed to do it. And, like, that, and then the obsession that we all have with how teams deal with the parades today, and yeah. just the pomp and ceremony, it comes from a real thing. It comes from the teams marching. This is, they were marching their traditional route from the town square to the to the pitch, and it was like a very important thing. It was when I was reading that, I was like, "Okay, I'm in. I'm into this now. I want to see what happens here." And for a couple of reasons, they they did it. They did it first of all, of course, they didn't have dressing rooms, so they're talking out in hotels or in pubs in the middle of town. Number one, but number two, it's like this Gaelic Pied Piper. You know, you start off in the middle of the town and you walk through the main streets. You've got music leading you along the way. You've got banners and flags and men walking along with their hurleys over their shoulders like their rifles. Yeah. And it's a statement to say, we're on our way to the field, come and join us. And people, that's what people did. They f- flowed to the pitch behind these parades and they all paraded uh, t- to, to the pitches. And it was so, it became such a big thing within, within the Gaelic world, the parade, to arrive onto the field and they walk into the field and those who are there already start cheering at the sight of hurlers walking onto the field. And that, if you put it in the context of the 1880s, is an act of rebellion in some ways. It's oh, like it's entirely, an, and it's a big statement. It's a, like the, the story of the 1880s is the story of land war. So you have the land of Ireland, previously the domain of 5,000 landlord families. Now, the tenant farmer is rising and saying we're taking it, and you get the start of a land revolution which lasted 40 or 50 years, but in the 1880s was absolutely intense. It was war in the countryside. And several of the hurlers who played in this championship were evicted from their farms, including the captain of the, of the losing team in the final from, from, from Milik. So there's land war there, but there's also, for the first time in two generations, the sense that Ireland can have its own parliament again because Charles Stuart Parnell is driving Ireland towards home rule and in 1884 into 1885, there's a, there's, the Home Rule Bill is coming before the House of Commons. And you think that actually Ireland, Dublin could have its parliament again. And third of all, the Irish Republican Brotherhood are leaving that scent of revolution in the air. A, one of their splinter group actually puts a bomb in Downing Street in that year. The two leading British officials in Ireland are murdered walking through the Phoenix Park. So all around the country, the IRB are organising and they see in the GEA the manpower which will feed their rebellion. And so that's why they're trying to take it over in the midst of all this. In the midst of all this. They see it. These are, these are the bodies they need to free Ireland. And who's fighting them within the GAA to make sure that it, it doesn't become just another arm of the IRB? Who's fighting them are two different groups. There are a group led by Catholic priests who are involved in the organisation. Now, some priests had nothing to do with the GAA. They had no interest in it. And other priests, they loved sport and they joined the GAA. And others wanted to keep an eye on their parishioners, so they joined. So there were priests who saw 
the IRB attempt to take over the GEA in 1887, right in the middle of the championship, and they pushed against it. But right in the middle are a whole group of men who cannot be, be identified with either priests or with Republicans and who see the GEA as a sporting organisation. They're there for the hurling, they're there for the football, they're there for athletics, they're not there for revolution, <laughs> they're not there for religion, and, and they, they just play. want to play. Yeah. And, and it's, it's always been like that. Well, I was going to say, it's not like that changed anything. I mean, you can see parts of that still uh, at Congress now. Where, like, oh, you see it much, much more than at Congress. You see it in the official rule book. Like, it's an extraordinary thing to do now to read the official rule book of the GA, to read the first page of it, and to see what the supposed aims of the GA are, and then square that with how the great majority of its membership actually live and how the organisation itself actually works. So the residues are, are they're very real. They're alive in terms of a rhetoric, but not in terms of a reality. So that's, I guess, what, what draws you a little bit to this as well, is that like um, this isn't the story of then alone. It is clearly the foundation, the, 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 the foundation text of everything that comes afterwards. You can't understand why there's a provincial championship without understanding the first All-Ireland because there was no provincial championship in the first All-Ireland. They changed it for the second one, and it's been there ever since. Yeah, that drunken two-day bender that they go on. <laughs> it was only at the it end. wasn't failure, Joe. Okay. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, they, they did actually have a meeting, and they did actually do stuff, and there were drinks in, uh, in the evening. I take your point, though. But, but they, they decided that because teams had pulled out of the championship because they were being asked to travel too far, that they would organise it on a provincial basis. It was as simple as that. And it seemed to make sense. Um, we haven't talked yet about uh, Davin and Cusick, who are kind of the two of the, the um, bigger figures in the book. Um, both of them cricketers, uh, yeah. both of them interested in athletics. Um, Cusick eventually turns his back on all that. Like he's a, He has a damaging conversion to foreign sports bad uh, at some point along the way. Cusick, as late as the autumn of 1882, called for the establishment of cricket clubs in every parish in Ireland because they were the type of club that would actually give men and give boys good temper, bravery, courage, stoicism under pressure, all of that. He called for that to happen. He had previously, even in 1882, he was playing rugby, he previously founded a rugby club and affiliated it to the Leinster branch of the Rugby Football Union. And Cusick himself played in the first ever Leinster Senior Rugby Cup match, which is out in, uh, out in Donnybrook, on the ground there. So these, this was a man who was absolutely from the modern British world of, of sport, that world of cricket and rugby and athletics. And Morris Davin was kind of like a gentleman, big farmer. He was a, a, a wealthy man from South Tipperary, from Carrick and Shore. Um, he took over his farm, family farm when he was 18. Also ran a river haulage business. And... He was a man who himself was involved in athletics and hunting and all of that type of type of world. Yeah. Where does the Venn diagram of their um, interests collide? Um, they're totally different personalities, so it's not in personality. I mean, Cusick was a brilliant man. Angry? Cusick had a screw loose. Uh, like he, was, he, was a, he was a genius, like absolutely a genius, conversant in Russian and French literature, a brilliant mathematician, a beautiful writer. All of those things, but a flaw. His genius. script, we see that I'm reading it. And I'm like, I can read every word here the way. Oh yeah, normally, he, like he he is he he just has a, he has a gift for communication, but he also has a gift for falling out with anybody who he meets, and it's a very signal fact of Cusick's capacity to fall out with people that within two years of establishing the GEA and seeing that organisation thrive, the rest of the membership threw him out of the organisation. Yeah because of the way he conducted himself. Now, Davin, on the other hand, was stoic, methodical, sensible, organised. He, he ordered encyclopedia. When he was an athlete in the 1870s, he ordered newspapers all around, from all around the world to see what his opponents were doing. He kept cuttings on them. He was the one who wrote the first rules of the game. He could play the violin right. in the evenings. You just get this picture of this kind of gentleman farmer. Yeah. And their shared interest was athletics and a belief that the, the athletics world in Ireland wasn't properly, wasn't properly run. But where Hurling sits in this is that Cusick changed. Cusick started to read books at the end of 1882 about Satanta and Cú Cullen, pop, which had just been published for the first time in Ireland, popularly. Pulp, pulp literature or like kind of pulp, proper... It was the f first time they'd been published in kind of pulp form, in, right. in pulp form. Previously, they'd been available only in really expensive editions. Manuscripts where like yes. the and monks had basically... So they finally come out. 
they'd finally come out on a new editions, popular editions. And Cusick starts reading them, and he sets himself immediately this notion that he's going to revive hurling. Right. And between October... It's just the madness. It's the the definition of madness, in a way. He totally turns, because another thing happened at exactly the same time. Everybody thinks the revival of the Irish language started in 1893, Cunningham and the Gaelic, 1892, that period. And, of course, it's not. There's a society for the preservation of the Irish language comes in the early 1880s, and then or in the early 1870s, and and then Eintacht na Gaelga comes in 1882, and Cusick is right in the middle of that. So he starts into language revival. So language revival, literature revival, and these stories inspire him to a kind of start a sporting revival. Now, already there is still some hurling being played in Galway and in Tip and in pockets. So what what Davin and Cusick do is kind of take this and just expand it out. That, yes. Well, not, so not just, but like they, they, they help to expand this out. So what was, what, was, what was in existence in 1882 was a pocket of hurling in North Tipperary, a pocket in East Galway along the banks of the Shannon, a pocket in North Kerry, a little bit in, in Kilkenny, a little bit around Cork City, and then up in East Antrim and West Donegal. There are the games of hurling, but there are no clubs in, organised in the modern way. There is no coherent set of rules. There is no national organisation. And all the time, these little small hamlets of hurling are being pushed to the margins by the spread of modern, the modern sporting organisations of rugby and cricket and soccer that we know now. Yeah. The, basically, the culture of the British Empire yeah. is pushing them right to the edge. And it's at that moment where does hurling survive and modernise or does it become something like that's almost like a kind of a folk memory that's recreated, reenactments like the Vikings or something like that yeah, that's, yeah. Re- that's done on special occasions or is it made into a real sport? So it could have it could have slipped away. It could have slipped right to right to the margins and beyond. But they move instead to codify it, to write a rule book, and to try and spread the game based on their rule book. Yeah, and is it immediately successful? Or, or like, what what are the pitfalls that they face? Well, first of all, there's a rejection in places like East Galway of the rules that Davin divides uh, designs. Um, one old hurler from East Galway wrote to the newspapers and said, "Listen." Your modern rules for hurling, which were very loose, by the way, and pretty physical, he said, but this this hurler from East Galway wrote, they're, uh, this, that you're you're trying to create a game that's as effeminate as lawn tennis. Right. So so we're we're not joining. <laughs> uh, so they they don't come in at all. Number two, there is a great thing. Just because you establish an organisation and you decide you're in charge, doesn't mean you're in charge. You can't just announce that here you are, and everybody falls into step. So loads of people were still playing hurling, but they weren't affiliating to the GEA. Yeah. Which ultimately, of course, was the reason why the first All Ireland Hurling Championship was undertaken three years later. Yeah, the the story of that whole thing about um, the the two teams and eventually getting the the game on, and it, its mirror image in football um, takes up portions of the book and kind of begins to explain just the difficulties of how the whole thing falls apart and ultimately why they end up making that decision to have the provincial championships. Um, that does sound like it was a, a good two-day meeting. Um, to go back to some of the amazing details, there was a brilliant bit in one of the football games. It was um, Templemore against Commercials. That was it, yeah. So um, there's a, a goal chance. and all Oh, yeah, Jack here Bracken. Yeah. So it's Limerick Commercials against Templemore in the semi-final of the All-Ireland Football Championship. And... Commercials are attacking with two minutes left. And in the rules at the time, in both football and hurling, a goal was worth more than any number of points. So you score 13 points. It was never happened at the time anyway. You score 13 points and I score a late goal, I win. Regardless. The game is level. Or, uh, and commercials attack. And they're about, the goal's open and there's a commercials forward about to, to roll the ball into the net. And it's and, and put them to and, and um, Templemore gone. When J.K. Bracken, the stalwart of the Templemore Club, appears out of nowhere with a flying rugby tackle and turns the commercials forward upside down. And now, allowing for the fact that the tackle in Gaelic football has always been difficult to define, this is by any stretch of the imagination a foul. And it's a foul rendered all the more severe by the fact that J.K. Bracken was actually an umpire um, <laughs> at, at the match. So these things happen again and again during this, during this championship. <laughs> And, and today, I mean, and today, J.K. Bracken's so son, like J.K. Bracken's son was Brendan Bracken, who turned out to be Winston Churchill's main aide. Wow! In, uh, in, so J.K. Bracken was a devout Irish Republican who spent all his life trying to uh, foment rebellion 
around Tipperary as well as promote the GA. But uh, his son ended up being Winston Churchill's um, uh, chief aide. That's a bit mad. It is a, a, another, a, what, yet one more bizarre story. Yeah, there's a, there's, um, there's a good book in that guy's character. The decision to turn this into a book, what, what did that come from? Um, I'd been at it for 20 years just putting stuff away and yeah. I'd written... So you knew this was coming that whole time? I, I, you've done loads of books in the meantime. I, yeah, I'd actually intended to write this book about five years ago, but I started to write it and I got kind of sidetracked into doing a bigger book on the history of sport in, in Ireland because I was trying to tell the history of sport in Ireland using this book, which is a really stupid thing to do. So I backtracked from that, did that as a different project and uh, kept going, just putting stuff away for this and just went through a series of drafts and cut yeah. cut down. Like This started as a very long book. I'd say so, yeah. It started as a book of more than 150,000 words and it's, it's half that now. So yeah. it's it's it's... it's cut back to something that's very manageable. Yeah, with uh, amazing um, notes and annotations at the back as well. The, the last set piece that I wanted to talk about was the, uh, the ill-fated American invasion, um, which is this, like, great idea, we're going to go to the States and make loads of money. I mean, the GPA and uh, various county boards have the same idea to this day. Uh, they seem to be a little bit better organised <laughs> nowadays <laughs> than they were. But, like, I mean, if anybody was um, to, in any way superstitious, the trip on the way over is definitely a harbinger of doom. <laughs> <laughs> There's great scenes where all these like uh, country lads from the the, the inner There's men from Offaly and Tipperary and the middle of Midlands, Limerick and yeah, yeah. they basically and they, they, they haven't been on a legs. boat before <laughs> and they get onto this boat uh, leaving from Cove and they're heading for New York and it's idyllic the first night and day it's idyllic they're they're meeting these Swedish women and Norwegian women and they're dancing at night waltzes and it's a beautiful steel cam and they move on and the next day the storm hits and the storm throws them around the sea like no one's business and they see this other ship or this a smaller boat which has had the sail ripped off it and it's cast aside in the tears and they're even worse and they basically vomit repeatedly for day after day and there's people crying and they want to go home and it's, a, it's a, as you say, a harbinger for what's about to come uh, in America where this idea, basically 52, just over 50 athletes between footballers, hurlers and runners and weight throwers went over there and it was they thought they were going to make a lot of money they would stage athletic events everything, and they would establish the GAA yeah. in the United States amongst the Irish community and it was such a disaster it's hard to explain, first of all it snowed like <laughs> extraordinarily heavily so a lot of events were cancelled in New York, the hurling match was so fierce that all their hurleys were broken. They had to get new hurleys made of hickory, and they didn't last well. Um, they didn't last well either. They um, they had a weight throwing competition where one of the weight throwers threw threw his hammer and hit a child and seriously injured a child. <laughs> they had to cancel the last leg of it. Twenty of the fifty two didn't come home. I mean, why would you? <laughs> they, they emigrated. They stayed. They stayed in America. For, for, for the rest of the times. And another dozen came home only to tidy up their affairs and go back out. So far from it being... And, and by the way, they only managed to get home because um, uh, Michael Davitt, the leader of the Land League, wired them out a few hundred pounds to, to cover the cost, to get them home and to buy off the promoters who wouldn't yeah. let them leave without paying them. We're not great at colonising, it turns out, the Irish. No, <laughs> no. No, but it, it is a reminder, actually, that there are very few new ideas out there. I mean, we like to think we're... We're, we're re- way ahead of the curve, for example, in this fundraising in America. They tried to do it. Yeah. We like to think these things about ice baths and ways of people training are all new. They were doing it in the 1880s. It's a, it is a, an amazing... Was it enjoyable, or is that process of cutting it down and leaving the stuff out a bit like kind of, you know, leaving one of your kids off a team? Um, no, it was fine. I, 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 I'd be very, very uh, pragmatic about these things. Um, I'm not precious. Um, uh, when it comes to something like this, if it makes the story easier, you can get consumed by your own ego. Yeah, and but think it's that every single detail has to go in. It's a bit of life's work, you know. Twenty years working on a project and to see it come into fruition. Oh, it's fun though. That's not work though. That's fun. Like it's it, it's it was such a fun book to work on, and it wasn't difficult to do. Well, it comes across. Congratulations, it's brilliant. Thanks a million, Jerry. Thank you. Available in all good bookshops, and and wherever people buy books these days. I hope so. Good man, Paul Rice. Thanks very much. Thanks, sir. Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.